let's try now. Yeah, it's coming. I just need to pick the right slide. Yeah, actually, uh, we can see that. A bit fast, but we can follow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now it's on full screen. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, and you have the coffee break, so don't don't be rash. Don't worry. Okay. So basically, what? So I will I'll continue. So we work on very different topics, and I would say, I mean, this topics is very much close to I mean to to the physics, and it's basically how to do this ultra wide band optical phase detection beyond the thermal noise limit. And as I will show you here, I mean, machine learning can really be very helpful that when you want to detect optical phase beyond the thermal limit, because in many cases, I mean, you are really, I mean, optical phase is very important in, in you know, metrology, in communication, in, in sensing, and, and, and it's, it's, it's very important to have this very sensitive tool for detecting on the phase. And if you're interested in some of the work or the references, I mean, these are, they are, they are listed here. So why is it important to measure the optical phase? Well, I mean, for optical communication systems, it's, I just need to get the laser pointer. It's some kind of obvious because basically, first of all, for coherent optical communication, I mean, the data is encoded into the phase of the optical field. So basically, the more the more accurate phase estimation you have, the the higher the more module the higher order modulation you can transmit. But there's also another tendency actually is to use DSP-free lasers for data center links. So basically, this would mean that you use very ultra stable lasers or frequency combs. And then you actually do not need to have a digital carrier recovery to composite for the phase. So this I've seen as a little bit of a new trend actually of how to use these stable lasers or stable frequency combs to, pro to, prefer, to provide the frequency grid for very, very, very short range data center links. And that's why it's important to perform this noise characterization of lasers and frequency combs. And then also in quantum key distribution, especially if we are interested in a continuous variable quantum key distribution, then it is, those systems are very similar to, to telecom systems, but they operate with a very few photons per symbol. And also there, I mean, the fa you, since you do a coherent detection, I mean, it's a quantum limited balance receiver you have. I mean, the optical phase plays a big role. So you need to do a phase compensation for a quantum key distribution, continuous variable quantum case distribution systems as well. So in that manner, I mean, it, it's really important to characterize how, how, how different frequency components of the phase noise spectra affect your system. And then also, of course, I mean, there is this problem of gravitational wave interferometry where you actually, it's like an interferometer and you extract the phase. And there is also another application for the ultra stable clock generation and transmission of ultra stable clocks. I mean, we're gonna, if you want to transmit those frequency references, I mean, we would like to really keep them very stable even though after the fiber transmission. And in this case, we need to, See, I mean, how does the fiber actually influence the, the phase noise of the of those ultra stable clocks? So lower bound on, for example, on the laser phase noise is dictated by the quantum noise. But the question is, how do we measure it? How do we access it? Because once we made a phase noise measurement, I mean, we are limited also by the thermal noise. So how can we actually remove this thermal noise to actually access the, the amount of quantum noise added by the frequency comb or by the laser? And if you look at this film, I mean, I mean, for example, the conventional methods, I mean, for measuring the optical phase, I mean, they're based on delay interferometers or cross correlators. And basically, I mean, there are a lot of optical fiber sensing schemes that implement this delay interferometer to extract the phase. But if you use this optical delay interferometer, I mean, you're, you're not somehow filtering the thermal noise. So basically when using delay interferometer, you don't have an optimum receiver in phase. And then you may impact it by the thermal noise. And this thermal noise will, set, will give you a measurement noise floor, which, which will set you a limit up to which frequencies you can measure. And typically when we measure the optical phase, I mean, 
phase noise, we can measure it until maybe 10 megahertz. And then also this thermal noise, which again results in a measurement noise floor, will set a limit on the range where we can measure. And we cannot, so, so this means that we cannot measure below, okay, we should have said here, minus 150 dB radians per, per hertz squared. And more or, for example, especially for the fiber sensing, I mean, you're really interested, you know, in having as, 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 as long sensing range as possible. And then, you know, fiber has an attenuation. So, so the back refractive signal in the case, for example, distributed acoustic sensing, I mean, it will be very much attenuated. So again, you have a problem of estimating the phase because with, for example, distributed acoustic sensing, all the information of the strain on the, on the different pathways in the phase and estimating the phase from the low power signal, this can be quite, quite tricky. And then something new what we are figuring out and what we are working on is actually the impact on the amplifier noise on the phase. So basically we are trying to see what is the quantum limit on the contribution of the amplifier noise to the phase. And this is a bit a, a relevant actually for the, for this, for, for the, what is it called? For the fiber sensing system and also for the laser system, because when you build the laser, you typically have a cavity which gives you a certain power and then you have an amplifier that amplifies the signal. And you would actually like to know how much does the amplifier contribute to the phase noise. And then if you look beyond, you know, single frequency lasers, I mean, we would also like to have some tools how to characterize phase noise of frequency comps and especially how to identify the noise sources within frequency comps. And what it, so, so, so this is a bit of an unexplored field, especially because the state of the art methods are not optimal according to the statistical learning theory. So basically, you know, given a measurement, how do we extract the phase in an optimum, in a statistically optimal way? So a little bit about the noise definition. So if you look at the ideal oscillator or an ideal output of the laser, I mean, where there is no noise, I mean, then it can be written as a ST, amplitude and cosine to the 2P, F zero T and, and this is the frequency. And if we look at this in the frequency domain, we just have a single, single, single frequency or we have this Dirac Delta function. And then for example, if you, if you look at the total phase, it's the frequency plus phase here. But if we don't have any phase noise, I mean, then this is phi of T is just a constant. Now, if you look at the real oscillator, then we have both contribution from amplitude noise and the phase noise. And if we want to write it mathematically here, we have the amplitude times one plus A of T, where A of T is actually amplitude noise. And then we have a cosine F zero T, which is some kind of a, of a, of a mean frequency. And then we have a phi T, which is the, which is the phase noise. Oh, just a second. Sorry for the break. So basically, and, and here we all, what you also have is a measurement noise. So if we plot the, the, the spectrum of, a, of, a, of an output of a real oscillator, we see that we have this broadening of the line. And then we have this noise floor here. And this noise floor is due to the measurement noise. And then if you look at the instantaneous frequency, the instantaneous frequency is the derivative of the total phase here. But then the problem is that we, we, have, the, we have a contribution here from the measurement here. Oh, just to say, my, my son is right. Sorry, okay. So, so basically, if, if you look at description of, of noise in time domain and frequency domain, we see that, for example, that we have, if this is a sign and then we have intensity noise, then we have this fluctuation in the amplitude here. And this is actually a random fluctuation. And in the frequency domain, this corresponds that actually there is, there is a, some kind of a amplitude noise here on this, on, on, on the tone here. If you look at the phase noise, I mean, then we have the fluctuation in, in, in time. So, so, 
So, so we don't know the, the exact position of our sine wave. And if you look at the frequency domain, if you take the Fourier transform, then we have the broadening of the line here. Now, the tricky part is if we have, if we, for example, have the measurement noise or the thermal noise, then it will also perturb our, our oscillator. But then this, if you look at, if you do, for example, a Fourier transform of this signal, then you will have obtained a noise floor. Now, the thing is that until now, you know, there has been this common belief that you cannot detect anything below the thermal noise floor. But this is not completely true because if you have a if you have an optimal phase detection scheme, you can actually detect signals way below the thermal noise level, and this is what I will show you now. So the thermal noise level in itself is not a is not a lim is, is not a fundamental limitation when detecting the signal. And this is very important because when we look at the optical frequency combs, I mean they have applications in many places. And there, I mean, for example, we need to really distinguish these different types of, 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 of noise sources. Because if we are going to use frequency comb for clocks, frequency time transfer or low phase noise microwaves or coherent leaders, we really need to take care of having as clean possible frequency comb lines as, as shown here. And then, you know, if we look at the, another thing in, in the frequency comb, well, we have a relative intensity noise, we also have the time jitter between the pulses. And that means that, for example, this, this whole thing and the, the entire spectrum will be moving. And you will actually like to quantify this. So how do we do this? Well, I mean, as I already mentioned yesterday, I mean, we are developing this uniform framework for noise characterization. And basically we are borrowing most of the things from the, from the digital coherent detection where we do everything in a DSP. So basically here we have a laser or a frequency comb under test and we beat it with a local oscillator comb and we just use a single branch balanced photo detector. We do A to D conversion, and then we do all the processing offline. Basically what you would do is we extract the phase noise and we extract the relative intensity noise. And from those things, we build amplitude and phase noise correlation matrices. And then once you build these matrices, you can do singular value decomposition and identify those noise sources, as I will show you later on. But so, so what is the advantage and how does the machine learning impact this? Well, first let's, le let's take one step back and look at the conventional phase measurement. So in a conventional phase measurement, we still have a balanced detector. We have analog to digital converter and then this is the, the homonite beat that we are detecting. What we do is we remove the mean and then we take the discrete Hilbert transform because if we take the Hilbert transform of this, of this signal, we get sine. And then we can actually form this complex quantity here. And then if we take the angle of this, then we get the phase. But this phase also includes this frequency offset, delta omega. So we need to do this detrending or just we need to remove this delta omega. And then we have the phase. We have phase evolution of the phase noise in time domain. Now the trick is, I mean, how to actually to compute the power spectrum densities. And since phi of k is a stochastic signal, we cannot just take Fourier transform. We need to approximate its power spectrum density. And one way of approximating is used by using this periodogram with certain type of windowing. So, so, so there, if, if you really want to look at, you know, at the accuracy of the phase, maybe the better idea would be to look in the time domain, because as soon as you start taking the Fourier transform and computing the power spectrum density, you start approximating. And this is actually an example of the limitations of the of the current optical phase measurement techniques. So here I have a phase noise power spectral density in dB radians hertz per radian square per hertz as a function of frequency. So what I plot here is I plot the shot noise floor, the thermal noise floor, and then I plot actually the, the reference. So basically the blue line is the reference phase noise spectra. So, because this is a numerical simulation, we have the reference, and this corresponds to a line of, of around 50 hertz. And then what I do is actually, I take, I, I apply conventional method to estimate the phase. And what I do is I be, get behavior shown with the red curve. And what I can see here, up to 10 megahertz, I have a very good agreement with my reference, but afterwards, this curve flattens out, and basically it, it becomes limited by the thermal noise and the shot noise levels, mostly thermal noise level in this case, because we are limited by thermal noise. And this is typically what you would encounter in a measurement scenario. So there is a lot of information actually here missing 
because you don't actually get the full picture of your face of, of your face profile. But what we are doing actually, or we are applying, is we are applying a technique from machine learning community called Bayesian filtering. And in this Bayesian filtering, what we do is we use a state space model and we say, well, we have some kind of a model of our phase noise. And then we try to estimate this model from the measurement. So these are our hidden states and this is our measurement variable. And then what we need to do, I mean, so in this case, we use a very simplistic model, but this model can be replaced, for example, with a recurrent neural network or a feed forward neural network. But this is just, I mean, because since we are just interested in the proof of principle here, I, we just approximate it with a random walk. But you can actually approximate the evolution of the phase if it's more complicated, for example, with a neural network. And then the task is actually how to determine first those static parameters, QK and RK, which is the measurement noise. And in this case, I mean, this Bayesian filtering problem, we try to approximate it with extended Kalman filter. And the reason is because once we start taking the measurements, we have like 250 million samples to process. So we want something that is very fast. I mean, there are many ways of solving the state space problem, but I think extended comma filter is a very good trade-off between the accuracy and the speed. So basically what we'll, with extended comma filter is formulating it this way is an optimal phase filter. And then we obtain the phase and then we compute the periodogram and we can plot phase noise power spectral density. But as mentioned earlier, we need to determine some of the model parameters here, which are the static parameters. And what we observe here, I mean, I go to, the, to, the, to this figure is that if I use this approach, which I call here ML to estimate the phase, I get complete overlap with my reference trace. So as you can see here, I mean, I'm not limited by my thermal noise level. I can operate way below thermal noise level limitations given by the conventional phase detection method. And this is actually very powerful in many cases. I mean, either for characterization of noise sources or also for like all the sensing that has to do with the phase. So if you want to build a very large interferometer, I mean, you're interested in estimating the phase. And I think this method is a very good way of estimating the phase. So these are somehow, you know, proof of principle advantages that by using this type of Bayesian filtering, you can actually operate below the thermal noise level. You can, ex and you, as you can see here, you can extract phase up to 10 gigahertz. Okay, and the most important thing is actually that this type of phase detection operates very close to the, to the quantum limit. So if you look at this curve here, I mean, this is the phase variance, which again, it can be computed in, in numerical simulations because we know the true phase and we, we, we estimate the phase and then we can compute the variance as a function of input power. That's the, the, the red curve. So that's the quantum limit. And uh, basically the blue curve is mean square error computed when we use this patient filtering to estimate the phase. And uh, actually the, the black curve is actually a byproduct because your common filter gives you also the variance. And this variance is indeed a mean square error. So what it shows here is that you can, by using this phase estimator, you can operate very close to the quantum limit. The reason why you have this discrepancy here is because this limit has been derived for very small phases. So that's why, I mean, there is discrepancy to the quantum limit, but it's, but it shows you that, that actually that, that this is a very accurate method. I mean, it's almost, you know, very close, couple of dBs from the, from the quantum limit. So if you look at experimental results, and this is a joint wor work with the Professor John Barrow's group from UCSB. Well, there we try actually to, to see, I mean, how much benefits that this phase, noise, phase measurement techniques brings compared to the state-of-the-art equipment. And in this case, we had an uh, instrument from OE Waves, which is a state-of-the-art phase noise measurement instrument. And basically, I mean, what you can see here is that because the power, I mean, this was, again, what we measured is, is the noise coming from the cavity of the laser. Because this, was, this is what you will typically do. You will build your, I mean, in, in, in the lab scenario, sometimes you, you, you don't want to amplify your signal because it, it, it reduces the signal to noise ratio. So you want to use directly output out from your cavity. And you see, by using this instrument, you have this green curve, which is on top of the, the curve, the blue curve, which is the, phase noise measurement obtained using this Bayesian filtering. And you see you have a huge improvements in terms of the, the measurement range because the, measure, the instrument can measure up to 100 megahertz while we can measure to 10 gigahertz. And also the range shows because these green curves would start to flatten out that you can actually measure below this uh, thermal noise limit. 
because it's not really eliminated because the noise is additive and can be filtered. And the important part is that, that you can actually, finally, you can identify actually what is the quantum limited line width or shallow times line width of your laser. Because basically, I mean, all this slow perturbation on the cavity, like thermal or temperature and stress, they will be valid up to a couple of, of, of megahertz. But in this range, you are mostly dominated by the quantum noise. So this is really the true line width of your system. So I know there've been a lot of reports on how to measure the line width, but I mean, it, you really need to measure in this gigahertz range in order to be to make sure that actually the line that you're measuring is the quantum noise limited line width of your laser. And then we also teamed up with the, with the, with the Danish company called NKT Photonics to measure their fiber lasers because the fiber cavity has much less quantum noise compared to the semiconductor cavity. The previous slide was measuring on a semiconductor cavity. And basically what we show here is actually the green curve is you know, state-of-the-art measurement instrument that, and the black curve is our method, which we use here EKF, is that we can actually measure way below this thermal noise limit, which is given by this conventional method. And also we can identify the true line width of your laser, which is around 0.7 Hertz. And this is much less compared to the green curve, which you would get with the state-of-the-art measurement. So it, this method has a really true advantage compared to the words and the state of the art in measuring the quantum noise limited of the quantum noise limited line width of the laser. And the only way you can you can if if you if you if you want to do if you want to measure this quantum limited phase uh, line width is actually to lock your laser to some kind of a stabilized cavity. But that's very difficult. So this shows that actually you can you know you have a better way of, of measuring this line width by using this method. Okay, so what I've already shown you this, I mean, so basically what we can also do here is, is we can see, I mean, how close can we operate to the quantum limit if we start to do some, some modulation here. So basically in this case, I mean, this is a very low power communication system where we have a laser, we have a phase modulator, which we modulate, and then we have a local oscillator and a balance receiver. And in this case, I mean, the, the balance receiver is quantum limited. And basically, I mean, when we do BR as a function of input power, we see we are almost very close to the quantum limit using this, this type of, okay, in this case, we use unscented Kalman filter. And as you, you should notice here, the power is really, really low here. So, I mean, again, this shows that this phase sensitive detection scheme can really operate very close to the quantum limit. Okay, so then, Okay, these are just the frequency noise measurement for a very low power laser. So then if we look, if we try to expand now, so this was, these were the results for a single frequency laser. Now let's have a look what's happened if you have frequency combs, because in this case you have multiple frequency lines. So how do you characterize the frequency comb? Well, you can do it in a very similar way, because if you do this dual comb spectroscopy, basically you beat one comb with another comb and you use balance receiver. And then you can actually make sure that, that the frequency difference between your LO comp and, uh, and a transmitter comp falls within the bandwidth of your receiver such that you can detect as many lines as possible. So in this case, we were detecting 40 lines. And then actually our measurement system consists of these multiple lines where we have contribution from the amplitude noise and the phase noise and, and the measurement noise, NK. But we need to make sure that this, the reason why we take this summation is because we have a frequency comb, we have different frequency components. So in this case, the exercise is a very similar to the single frequency laser. What we need to do is actually, we need to track those frequencies and amplitude. In a conventional system, you will actually have a filter, filter out each line, and then you would do Hilbert transform and try to find the phase. But again, this is very ineffective and you can actually not estimate the, the amplitude noise as well. What we do is actually we built, again, we extend our framework such that we track both the amplitude and the phase noise. But in this case, you have many more parameters to track because in this case, you have also the correlation between the noise sources and so on. So basically it's the same as a single frequency laser, but just expanded in the, in the dimensionality. And we tested this method experimentally for an electro-optic comb. And this electro-optic comb consisted of the of the external cavity laser, intensity modulator, phase modulator in cascade. And then there was an RF oscillator who was, you know, we were adjusting the shifts to get the proper frequency lines. Now for the, for the electro optic combs, we have that the phase 
of of a one of the line m equals the phase coming from the laser times m, where m is the number of the harmonic times the phase of the RF oscillator. And what we would actually like to know is actually we would like to identify how much phase noise there is a contribution from the laser and how much is from the RF. Where M is this relative index and H is the number of phases we are having. So basically what we can do is actually we can compute covariance matrix or a sample covariance matrix. So variance is given here by the covariance matrix is just given by taking the vector of the phases and multiplying with, it, with, the, with, the, with, its, with its, its transpose as shown here. And then if you do this, you see that this mixed matrix will contain, con contain contributions from the, from the laser. And this is the, the variance of the laser phase noise and the RF phase noise. And the question becomes, how do we distinguish this? Because I mean, in this matrix, it's, it's not possible unless we do something clever. So basically, since we do the measurements, what we do is we, we do a covariance matrix estimation. And we define this observation time because then we can actually plot the singular value decomposition as a function of the of uh, of, 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 of the of, of the realization time. And this singular value decomposition is very similar to the principal component analysis, because also principal component analysis tells you I mean, what are the dominant noise sources or what are the main directions of your signal, and it, therefore it's it's a very useful technique. And this is actually the correlation matrices. So this again, numerical simulation where we have the true correlation matrix of phase. So this is 40 by 40. And this is the conventional method of estimating correlation matrix. And this is the machine learning one based. And you see, when you use the machine learning one, you have much better overlap between the true and machine learning one. While conventional method fails. Of course, as you increase the power, I mean, I mean conventional method approaches the machine learning approach method. But when you have such a comb, I mean, you are you're not always sure to have enough power in your lines. And this actually shows this phase noise root mean square error for a conventional and machine learning method. And you see that the, the accuracy of machine learning method is much bigger for low to moderate single to noise ratios. And now becomes the interesting part, because what I would like to show you this is, is something we published in, in Optic Express paper last year is to perform this eigen eigenvalue decomposition of your covariance matrix. Because these are the phases. And if you do this covariance matrix, then as I already mentioned it, you will have contribution from the noise from the laser and the RF oscillator. And if you do the singular value compositions, you will have the eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and this is the transport eigenvalues. And if you do some math, you see actually this eigenvector, first and second algorithm vector, corresponds to the variance of your noise sources. So by computing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you have access to the noise contributions of your local oscillator and the RF. And this is actually a very interesting plot shown here. So this is the eigenvalue as a function of reservation time. And what you observe here is that this eigenvalue increases and this value value increases. And this is because this is contribution from the, from the laser and noise phase noise. And this is contribution from the RF phase noise. And the rest is just a thermal noise. And if you use machine learning approach, you, so, and because we also have only two noise sources, RF and the laser. And see, the similar thing can be observed in a machine learning approach. But there, you also can identify some other noise sources not identifiable using the conventional method. So we, this show plot shows you I have four sources of a noise in my frequency comb. While this conventional method shows you well, I only have two. I mean. So this machine learning method gives you much better resolution of your noise. And then if you plot the eigenvectors, you see that the eigenvector one is constant because actually your, your, your laser noise contributes equally to all the lines while the RF noise increases as you move away from your carrier. And then you can basically reconstruct the contribution from the phase noise and the amplitude noise as shown here. I think this is a very nice property of this singular value composition that you can actually distinguish between the noise sources that affect your comb. And this is the variance using the conventional method and the machine learning method, and it overlaps fully with the true ones. And for the experimental data, you see, you get a much smooth phase evolution compared to the conventional method. So in this case, machine learning method provides significantly more accurate estimation. So I think I will end here because I will leave, I would like to leave uh, some time for questions and for my
for the last part, end-to-end -end learning, I think I will I will leave it for some other time where I can where we can meet and present it. Okay, Darko, thank you very much for the very nice talk. So um, the the lecture is uh, open for question. Let's see if we have any here. Okay, open the question. I think I don't. Uh, I don't uh, see uh, many of them. So either everything was clear or completely unclear. <laughs> or everybody is uh, it's, uh, in the coffee break already. But or everybody's in the coffee break. But I will refer you to this reference three if you're really interested in this. And I think it's, I mean, if you have some lasers you would like to characterize, I mean, we 